Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, again, uh, David Johnston from the Decentralized Applications Fund. And I'm excited to uh, be here today. I've known a lot of you for a long time in the uh, Israeli Bitcoin conference, but this is my first time in Israel. So I'm glad that I could be here in person and get to meet everybody. This is, in my mind, a big heart of the Bitcoin community. Uh, a lot of the people I've worked with have come out of this community, and so it's really exciting to, uh, to be here in person and uh, hopefully make it interactive this morning. I'll just talk briefly about uh, sort of my uh, views on decentralization and what we do with the Decentralized Applications Fund, and then hopefully open it up for questions and make it an interactive dialogue because that's the part that I really enjoy is you know, answering questions and getting into sort of what's going on in the world. So good to see a lot of faces that I recognize. But anyway, so without too much further ado, um, really the thing that I like to focus on is sort of how we move uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem forward in the context of replicating the Bitcoin model. And so this is something that I've thought about the last uh, year and a half or so a lot. And I ended up writing the white paper called uh, The General Theory of Decentralized Applications. And I basically put forth four basic criteria that I think really define a decentralized application that's following the model of Bitcoin. And obviously, the first aspect, really core to that, is the idea of using an open source platform instead of a closed proprietary platform in order to uh, build your technology. I mean. Obviously, Bitcoin couldn't exist in the form it does today if it was a proprietary standard. So I think that first one is, is fairly obvious. Um, the second sort of genius of, of the Bitcoin approach, in my mind, is the fact that it had its own digital token and could really uh, monetize the use of that open source software directly with the use of that token. So the old model, right, is you build Red Hat, right? If you're contributing to Linux and you want to you know, make a living, you build a service company on top of that open stack. So I think this idea of using a token instead is, is revolutionary in the fact that it's so elegant and simple as a way to align incentives of developers, of users, of everybody in the system towards the same goal of increasing the usage of that system. So really tokenization I think is an entirely new model that we can use in order to uh, achieve this idea of monetizing open source. The third idea I want to talk about just briefly is decentralization. And when I use that word, what I'm referencing is the idea that we can remove all of the bottlenecks. We can remove all of the points of failure in a system. This was obviously top of mind for Satoshi when he built uh, Bitcoin because a lot of the predecessors had had these bottlenecks that essentially caused the failure of the system, a centralized server that was entrusted with storing all of this information. So the idea of replicating all the data required to operate the system on the end nodes really removed that as a risk. And so I think decentralization as we build out these systems is really key. I, I really love what uh, Andreas Antonopoulos said. He said, um, people's first reaction to seeing a decentralized system is to build a centralized system on top of it. And they're usually wrong. Because that's often the easier I, uh, thing to do. It's easier to create a centralized solution on top of something. You simply say, well, I don't know how to decentralize this. I'll just you know, build a centralized service on top for now. But it's not scalable, and it's not a system-wide solution that really moves the whole ecosystem forward, in my opinion. So the idea of open source, the idea of tokenization, the idea of using a decentralized architecture, I think is really critical. And of course, the fourth item is a consensus mechanism. So being able to define and verify cryptographically that some node has actually added a particular value to the network is key. This removes the need for a bureaucracy or a company to really verify uh, the value somebody's providing to a network. So of course, in the case of Bitcoin, proof of work gives us the ability to show that a node is actually adding so much hashing power, right? 
The more hashing power they add, the more odds that they'll get the block reward. And my proposal is this isn't a mechanism that necessarily needs to be unique to Bitcoin. That we can use this way of um, defining things cryptographically as a general best practice and a general gold standard for building decentralized systems. And when we build a decentralized systems, if we can get to that level of quantification and attach a reward, then that's key in making a system globally scalable. So just to use one example, um, the folks over at MadeSafe have spent years uh, in their process trying to define exactly how a node gets rewarded for adding storage to an open storage system where anybody can add value uh, to that system. And they've spent an enormous amount of time uh, doing the hard work in order to make that possible. So that's, I think, a really good example, but I think we're gonna see, you know, I see folks in the room that are working on decentralized compute. I see people in the room that are working on decentralized transportation mechanisms. And expanding this cloud of protocols where we can define different types of value. And my basic estimation right now is we're at a point where these types of definitions we can make are very simple. Compute, bandwidth, storage, transportation. The most basic things that we can quantify, but I think this has an incredible cumulative effect. As we build these more simple protocols, we can build on top of them to build more and more complex systems. So I don't think that this is a stage or just a temporary thing. I think we're gonna see this ecosystem of protocols and of proofs, if you will, right? There's a proof of storage and a proof of compute and a proof of bandwidth. I think we're gonna see you know, an explosion of these types of proofs really expand over the next few years as we're able to build on top of them. Now, I wanna emphasize these aren't easy. Like, this is really, really tough stuff. There's some incredible minds trying to solve the big problems around, well, what do we do about bloat? And what do we do about transaction times? And what do we do about cost in this system? As everybody wants to put more and more information into these blockchains. And so it's encouraging to see all the really brilliant minds that are working on those core problems that need to get solved for this ecosystem to really scale. But I, I'm convinced that they will be solved. Uh, as I look out, there are now three or four major proposals to solve some of these key problems. And it, they're not gonna happen immediately, but I can see the teams coming together and the technology proposals that make it possible for where we can scale this technology. So that's my basic hypothesis. A lot of you have probably heard me talk about that before or see me on YouTube talking about this idea of decentralized applications. Um, I just wanna put a note, I think that language is really important, that defining these as sort of a new and novel entity uh, is really important in of itself. You know, we're in a brand new industry and we have the opportunity to invent this new language to really serve uh, what we're doing. So. With that, I'll kind of shift and talk just about a little bit about sort of what I've been up to the last year. Um, I got involved in Bitcoin in 2012, um, mostly coming from a, a free market economics type of point of view. I said, uh, you're telling me there's a non-governmental currency that can't be inflated. Okay, I would like to change all my money for that money. And it took me about four months, but that's what I did in 2012, was literally just change all of my fiat over into digital. And that sort of really led me down that road of understanding more and more about the technical aspects, understanding the power of the, the blockchain technology. And that led into 2013 during the San Jose conference where there was this incredible energy and combination of entrepreneurs and investors and people in the space, and there was no real group to really bring them together. And so I and Michael Turpin and Sam Milmaz ended up founding the Bit Angels in, it's hard to believe it was only May of last year. And it grew to be the world's largest angel group by membership, now is five or 600 members all around the world, and they only invest in the Bitcoin ecosystem. But my passion was really around this decentralized applications, and so, in March of this year, um, I worked with a few of the sort of most active investors and most active people from that space, and we built a decentralized applications 
venture fund that was tasked with only doing fully decentralized projects. So a lot of people still approach me, oh, you're the Bit Angels guy. And I say, yeah, but we're doing something more. We're doing something very focused now only around decentralized applications. And I often say, you know, if you have a company, if you have shares, I'm not interested. I'm interested in projects that are monetized through a token. And I really walk people through that whole definition of a decentralized application, what we're really looking for. And so we're looking for really low level protocols that build out these technologies for different spaces. And so it's been incredible to see that come together. It's exciting to see what the guys at Ethereum are doing. And I really think about Ethereum in the context of decentralized compute. I mean, it's a more narrow definition as Vitalik has defined it for me, um, consensus-based compute. And you know, I really love that idea of I can pay some money in the form of Ether and have this network run a contract, have run a smart property. And so I think we're gonna see expansions of that over this year, uh, and especially into next year, where people are sort of pushing that envelope uh, of what you can define and what you can do with computational power. So I think of those as the major three, storage, compute, and bandwidth. Um, if people are working on bandwidth projects, I would love to hear about them. Um, I'm following a couple of really cool projects to sort of define the value of people transferring data from one node to another. It's not an easy problem, but there are a lot of people working on a very innovative approaches to quantifying that information. So. Anyway, that's sort of our, our main core mission, and we've been at it now for seven, eight months, is just funding these underlying infrastructure projects that are gonna really build out the ecosystem. And I wanna say one thing about why I think this is critical. A lot of people have asked me, well, don't you think it's too early for Bitcoin 2.0 or crypto 2.0? Um, and I say, no, I, I don't think it's a matter of needing 100 million users in Bitcoin before you do these applications. I actually think it's the reverse. I think to get to 100 million, 500 million, a billion users, that we have to break into these new type of use cases that we're not into today. And the analogy I really enjoy using is that of the early days of the internet, right? If you think about the early days of the internet, 1992, 1993, 1994, it was very much the realm of people that were excited about the technology. But to really go mainstream, it got mainstream when there was a website for your particular interest. Whether that was collecting coins or you know, racing horses or whatever it was, as soon as there was a website and especially a web community that really spoke to your particular interest, all of a sudden the internet was really important to you. you know, I remember those early days and I was trading uh, stocks with my father and that's what got us an internet connection. Because we couldn't do that, we couldn't access eBay, you know, simply from his office computer, it became inconvenient, and that's what got the internet connection into our home. That was the use case that we cared enough about that we were willing to spend that money. So my argument for this space is we, I think, ought to embrace breaking into new use cases as early as possible because it pulls those particular communities into what we're doing and really makes it possible. So, you know, I'm really excited about the platforms that are sort of emerging just to focus on that. You know, we've seen the stuff that MasterCoin has done, we've seen the stuff that uh, Swarm has done, we've seen the platforms that are emerging where people can issue all these different assets and sort of begin to reach all of these different communities. I think that's really the key is institutionalizing or making extremely easy this ability to get involved in that ecosystem, sort of like the ability to create a website without having to be a programmer really opened up the general web for a larger audience. So I'll just stop there and kind of jump into questions. I'd love to hear what people you know, want to know about the space or want to know about particular projects or you know, questions they have in general, but this is sort of the passion that has consumed me the last two years. and. Uh, I really enjoy these events because it feels like a, a family reunion. I see a lot of people that I haven't seen in a while and uh, get to see them in person. So I really enjoy these events and appreciate you guys hosting me and uh, excited to be here and talk with you all in person. Thank you. 
I don't know if we have a microphone or if uh, our friend here, if you just raise your hand, he'll come and get you the question. I see we have one here. Yes, Vitalik. Did you just fly in like me yesterday? Uh, my flew in today, arrived at 430. You are even more ambitious than I am. Uh -huh. Okay, so you talked a, you, you talked a bit about mon about monetizing crypto platforms by creating tokens. Now, right. question is, have you thought at all about other kinds of virtual property that we can monetize? So, for example, monetizing namespaces. If you're building a decentralized forum, monetizing badges inside of that. Do you have any ideas regarding that? Yeah, and I really enjoyed your presentation in uh, Vienna on that topic. Um, where you got into that a little bit, and I'd encourage if anybody didn't see the YouTube video, hopefully they've posted it by now from the Vienna conference, Vitalik goes into, okay, what are the different avenues that we can use for monetization? My basic conclusion from talking to all these different projects is that it's different for every project. I think this is one of the things that makes decentralization really difficult is it's specialized to the particular platform. So yes, I think there are systems in which namespace is extremely valuable. Um, take Namecoin or others where you could essentially monetize that aspect of uh, the system because I think it's about identifying scarce resources or technical advantages in a particular system, I think is, is the real point. And I think that's different with every system. So let me go through at least one example. In some systems, you have to have an anti-spam mechanism. Because if you didn't, somebody would spam the network with four trillion requests, and therefore having a token that has a value simply as an anti-spam mechanism in some systems makes a lot of sense. And really, the system couldn't possibly run without it. And so that's a very sort of simple use case, but I think a very powerful one. Um, namespace is another. I've seen... <coughs> I've seen other approaches that have, have sort of piqued my interest the last year start to emerge where people are actually thinking about this in the context of a coupon um, is another approach where people are valuing the particular service at, let's say, a dollar per transaction for uh, uh, an exchange, let's say, and they're using the tokens as a coupon to access that service um, and you can use the token regardless of what the cost is. So let's say the price at the exchange, the fee would normally be 0.2%. And if you're making a you know, $1,000 or $10,000 trade, that starts to add up into real money. And the idea would be to use one of these particular tokens uh, instead of paying the fee and sort of creating a market value for that product. It's not my favorite approach um, for some applications because it's more difficult to decentralize price discovery in that system. Uh, you have to have more of a, this central entity says that this price is the value of this thing, but it is unique. I, I hadn't seen that. I have to give credit to uh, CryptoNext uh, group actually, uh, that some of the founders are here in Israel for first introducing me to that idea of uh, pegging a coupon and using that as a mechanism for monetization. Um, though I don't know if it's as applicable to other decentralized applications. So, but those are sort of the three I've seen. Coupons, namespace, anti-spamming purposes. Um, there's also other advantages that you have to find in these systems. So one example is uh, having a common trading pair. And so this is something that we've thought about a long time uh, in protocols like uh, the master protocol is, okay, in this system, there's a technical advantage to using a smart property token as opposed to using Bitcoin because it's easier to move around once already in the system requires one less transaction. And uh, technically, it's just superior as far as speed. And so the question is, does a common trading pair in that system have uh, a monetary value that could be used as a technical reason to use that token for that particular thing. So I'm sure we'll come up with many more, but those are three or four that I've thought through in a lot of depth, and I think it really depends on the particular project. But thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Hi, good morning. Um, two questions. Um, how do you see the U.S. financial system integrating Bitcoin um, into the market itself? 
uh, when talking about policymakers, and et cetera. And second, um, in terms of Bitcoin companies trading, traders, um, is there any regulation? Anyone can trade Bitcoins, you know, establish a company and trade Bitcoins, offer Bitcoins to the public, et cetera. So, I'd like to actually flip this on its head. I, I think that Bitcoin will integrate with the U.S. financial system in the sense that Bitcoin will radically improve the U.S. financial system. It's not that Bitcoin will adopt to regulation. It's that the system of record, let's say, from the Bitcoin system itself will revolutionary the, revolutionaries the, the idea in finance of transparency and accountability. So what I mean by this is, let's take Bank of America, for example. They had the pleasure of spending $17 billion, I believe it was last year, for fines. And basically what happened is it came out of a, a robo-signing scandal where they were foreclosing on people that were still paying their bill. And Bank of America, what had happened is they had lost track of who owned what. And this was a sort of side effect of the 2008 financial collapse. So some small bank created a mortgage, and then the mortgage was refinanced, and then the mortgage was turned into a derivative, and the derivative was sold to somebody else. And four or five or six steps later, 2008 happens, half these companies go out of business, nobody has the original contract, nobody knows who to pay or who, to, you know, who it goes to. I mean, the, the enormity of that, that <laughs> That loss and failure in the system is incredible. Um, $800 trillion in assets, something like 30% of them. We just don't know who owns this. I mean, that's, that's incredible to think about. So now we have what amounts to an immutable ledger, right? A ledger that can not be changed by any third party and can timestamp things in the cloud forever. What would you like to do with that? Could you take a document? hash that document, compress those records into a transaction, and mark forever that these particular documents existed in exactly this form, and that's verifiable by anybody in the future. That's what Paul Snow and the guys over at Factum are working on is, right, how do you make that? So you could do that with millions of documents, compress that into a single hash, and secure the blockchain. So I think we're gonna completely alter forever the financial system in the sense that we're gonna have complete transparency. We're gonna give them tools where they can timestamp everything. As far as the regulatory stuff, it's hard to say what'll happen. Um, ultimately, Bitcoiners and technology will go to whatever the friendliest jurisdiction is. If that's Israel, if that's the United States, if it's Switzerland, if it's the Isle of Man, doesn't matter. So I think jurisdictions compete, and so the jurisdiction that is the most friendly is gonna get the most of that business. And so, so far, the US is, isn't the friendliest. Um, there are parts of the United States, like Texas, that have been fairly open, but the proposals out of New York are very draconian. So we'll see what ends up happening, but I'm not going to miss out on billions of dollars of opportunity because of my zip code. I will move anywhere in the world where it makes sense. So that's sort of my approach. All right. I think we're all out of time, but thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Fun stuff, and I look forward to talking with all of you the next few days. Thanks. Thank you.